Hello everyone and welcome to episode one of our three-part guide for Beyond the Wire. Now first things first, Beyond the Wire has happily sponsored today's video and this series so big thanks to them and if you are looking to pick up this game make sure you check out the links in the description and in the comments. I highly recommend this game. You can watch my recommended video for this game which is you know Beyond the Wire. Should you buy it? And my answer was a resounding yes and even if you don't buy it now I do think it's still a game that you should be keeping your eye on. So in today's video and guide, we're going to be talking about a couple of topics for brand new players to the game and genre. So we're going to be talking about what is Beyond the Wire. If you haven't seen my videos before or haven't seen a Beyond the Wire video before, we're going to be talking about what the game is as a whole. We're also going to be talking about how do you win, basic mechanics, basic controls, everything a new player needs to know to get a consistent, enjoyable experience. And then after that, we're going to go into some general tips about the genre and how to maximize your enjoyment. So let's start right off. This is going to be the first screen that you see when you launch Beyond the Wire. And there are a couple things that we should kind of familiarize ourselves with before we jump into our first match. So the first thing I would recommend doing is heading over into the options to take a look at what kind of controls and settings we can tweak with, mainly because Beyond the Wire does not have a firing range or a tutorial. I can only assume that those are going to come with time because that is standard for games on the off-world core. And just a reminder that this is using the off-world core, the same core that Squad and Postscriptum use. So uh, for people that like those kind of games, you're probably going to like how Beyond the Wire feels because it's very similar in that aspect. And it's only going to get better and more different and more fully flush out with different features as time goes on so definitely something to keep in mind but let's head over to the options section so now that we're in the option section once again we're here to kind of familiarize ourselves with the controls mainly because there's no real tutorial or you know on-screen display of what the controls are and what might be important for us to know so first thing a lot of this is going to look familiar to people who have played squad before but there are some settings in here that you might like to have uh, tweaked to your own liking for example hold to aim down sights if you like that or not hold to crouch extremely important to know that you can change all these things in the settings uh, your graphics you want to make sure that you have your proper graphics i like having my frames a priority rather than having things look nice so you might have to go around and tweak with some things here there are some really good guides around that you can find for maximizing your frames for your particular system uh, we're not going to cover that in this video because that would have to be a very long video but definitely do some research and look to see what you should have enabled or disabled at, or at what level so that you can maximize your frames um, audio now one tip i have here is to make sure that you have command all the way to 200 percent now granted as a new player you shouldn't ever really be touching squad leader or commander or anything leadership oriented until you're more comfortable with the game but this is a tip for later on if you do choose to eventually take that responsibility and want to play that role having command at 200 percent is very useful squad i definitely bump up to 175 and local at 150 now as you can see i turn up the volume of my friendlies this is because communication in these style of games is extremely important you need to be able to use your microphone and to communicate with others that is what makes these games so much fun so please please i'm begging you if you play any kind of large-scale tactical shooter or platoon shooter please use your microphone encourage others to use their microphone and make sure that you guys are working as a team because that is what makes these games so unique you want to contribute and be a positive force in the community not someone that brings down that experience Moving on into the controls, we're going to take a look at a couple of important infantry settings. So in here, we have a couple things that you really should know how to do because Beyond the Wire is so focused on melee combat. You want to make sure that you have your equip melee button bound and you know what that is, as well as actually having your use weapon melee bound. This is how you're going to equip your bayonet and how you're going to charge. And you can set these and you can go and tweak other settings, but those two are very important to making sure you're getting the most you can out of Beyond the Wire. Because without bayonet charges, you're missing out on a significant part of the game. So let's jump in and take a look at the last few things here. You can choose a couple of interface settings to make things, you know, a little bit more user friendly, especially if you're new to these games, because it does help to know like when certain indicators pop up, your stance indicator, etc. cetera. Uh, some players like increasing or decreasing the name tags of friendlies uh, as they play so that, you know, you either get a really immersive experience or, you know, if you're really new to the games and you can't identify friendlies rapidly, this is a good way to kind of tweak that to make sure that you're team killing as little as possible. And that's pretty much all the settings we really need to dive into right now. Of course, you could spend more time looking around here and getting things exactly how you want them. But those are the main things that I would look at in the options. And it's important to know the controls that you're using so that when you actually get into a match, you aren't fumbling around as much. Okay, but now that we're done talking about controls and options, let's jump over to the multiplayer tab. 
Now, in the multiplayer tab, this is the server list. This is all the servers that are up right now that you can join as a player. Now, there are a couple of things that we're going to explain about this screen. First off, you have the server name right here, and this is important because I highly recommend that as a new player, you don't just randomly click on these servers. I think that you should do a little bit of research or at least know the name of the server that you're playing on so that when you're done playing, if you had a good experience on that server, perhaps you join this community's Discord. You get to know some of their players. You join that community, especially in these small niche games that have, you know, really tight knit groups playing them. It's incredibly rewarding and can drastically improve your experience if you find a tight knit group to roll with every single time you play because that improves the teamwork, it improves the communication, it, you know, you're making friends, and that's going to make it more enjoyable, rather than jumping into these games solo, which I don't really recommend. You might be doing that the first couple of times you play the game, but definitely, even if you don't join a community, make sure that you make friends, you add them, and you play with them, because that is what makes these games so good. It's the social interaction, it's the teamwork, it's the communication. So make sure you have a server that you regularly frequent, that way you get to know the regulars, you get to maybe know the community members, and that leads to a lot of other opportunities down the line. The next thing we're going to look at is the level. This is simply the map, so you can get a sneak peek on what map you're going to actually be loading into. And the next thing is game modes. There's two game modes currently within the game. There's front lines and there's assault. Uh, front lines is the game mode where it's kind of a tug of war and it goes back and forth depending on how many uh, caps you hold and the majority then it flips. And then assault is just a linear one team is always attacking, the other team is always defending. That's a very rough explanation of the game modes. The next thing that we do want to look at here is the player numbers. Now, to a new player, this might be a little confusing. We see a couple numbers here, and we don't necessarily know what that means. The first set of numbers here, like for example, 99s, is how many players are on the server right now. Plus 5 are how many are waiting in the queue. 99 is how many that the server can hold. So as you can see, this server is full. There's 99 out of 99 players, and there's 5 players waiting in the queue ahead of you. So if we were to double click this, we would be sixth in line to join the server. So just explaining how that works, because I know brand new players of the genre don't really know how to read this. And then finally, you have the ping, right? This is something that tells you what your connection to the server is like, if it's slow, if it's fast. Generally, you want to pick lower, uh, the lower the ping, the better. But you also want to balance that with, you know, do you know the server owners? Do you know uh, if the server is full, right? Because you don't really want to be joining a completely empty server, but you don't want to be completely joining, you know, maybe a server that has 500 pings. So it's always taking a look and making sure you're joining the right server. We're going to join a empty server just to kind of demonstrate some of the other mechanics. So let's go ahead and pick this server right here. And we're just going to double click and load in. All right, so we've just loaded into the server now, and this is going to be the team selection screen. This is the first thing that you see whenever you load into a server, and we're pretty much going to be explaining what we see right here. So at the top, we can see information related to the game mode, which we'll get to later. We can see the map that we're on, and we can see the game mode at the top right. Now, there are two teams on every map. You have French Republic, you have the German Empire, there's also the US, and the Brits are coming eventually. In this map, on Zonbeek for Frontlines, we're going French Republic or German Empire. Now, you have two buttons down here that show that you can join the French Republic or continue with the Germans. Continue means that you've already been auto-selected to join that side. For example, we can see here we're 1 out of 50 and 0 out of 50 here. The server's empty aside from us, so we're already on the Germans team. We can join it or we can try to switch. Now, usually servers have it restricted to where if it's unbalanced, there's too many players on one team, you can't join the team with more players. So that's an important thing to note, uh, but you are able to switch teams in this screen. We're just going to continue with the German Empire and move to the sections and roles screen. So this is the next important screen that you're going to see. And for new players to the genre, it can be a little overwhelming. So on the left here, we have the sections. If this was a full server, you'd see multiple different sections. You'd see the commander infantry sections. You'd see uh, recon sections. You'd see artillery sections. Uh, what you need to know as a new player is just focus on joining infantry sections. Don't create them and squad lead them yet because you aren't comfortable or familiar with the game enough, but join an existing infantry section. So... We're just going to create an infantry section here. It's going to look like this just because we're squad leading it. But like I said, as a new player, don't worry about doing this. There will be pre-made squads. So for example, if I was in a full server, instead of a leave button, it would say join. And you'd be able to join Karmica in his infantry squad. And then it would be 2 out of 10. And that's how you join squads. Now, when you join a squad, there's a couple of important things you want to do usually before you even select your kit on the right here. 
you're going to want to see if this squad has microphones. This is incredibly important because like I said before, communication in these large scale tactical shooters is incredibly important. You want to find a group of people that is actually talking to each other because loading in and joining a server or a squad that's completely dead silent and mute, it's just not a fun time. You'll realize like after playing round after round after round, the teams in the games where you have the most communication and the most teamwork on the large scale, you're going to get the most enjoyment out of. So definitely join and then mic up. So there's three keys to use your comms. You don't need to worry about command comms, which is default by caps lock. But you need to know how to talk in local chat, which is proximity, which is just the people around you can hear you is V. And then your squad comms, which is B. So knowing these two V and B keys is very important because that's how you communicate with other people in the game. So in this screen, if I were to join, I would hold down the B key and I would ask, hey, does anyone in here have comms? And then you'd either get a response or no response. And you want to make sure that you find a different squad if your squad isn't talking. And if none of the squads are talking, then try to find a different server. And this is where going back to finding a community or a group of people beforehand to play with is really, really important. That way, you know, going into it, you can get a consistent, enjoyable experience out of it. So let's say for the sake of our imagination and the guide that we joined a squad that is, you know, very talkative. They have good communication. The squad leader seems to know what he's doing. Let's move on to the kit now. So as you can see on the right, these are the kits or the roles. I'm currently the infantry officer because we created the infantry squad. You're not going to do that the first time you load in. But it's important to note that this is how you select your kits. The two kits that I would recommend all new players learn how to use is the rifleman role and the medic role. This is important because those two kits are almost always useful and they're very simple to play. You're not going to overwhelm yourself with learning how to play these roles. Eventually, you could graduate to light machine gunner and grenadier and assault, but these kits take a little bit more practice. You have to use them a specific way to be useful and it requires a greater knowledge of how the game works and certain mechanics behind certain features. So after you pick your kit, you might be able to pick different equipment. Now, as you can see, we can't select other kits or other equipment. These are locked by how many players are in your squad. And this is to make sure that you don't have just a whole bunch of one-man squads all taking assault or grenadier kits. It's to kind of balance the kit selection. So as we get more people in the squad, more of these roles and more of this equipment will open up. But we're just going to move on ahead with the simple rifle and move now to the deployment screen. So as you can see at the bottom here, it moves from team selection to section and roles down to deployment. Deployment is when you spawn in. Now, there's a couple different ways you can spawn, but usually anything that's yellow is a spawn in point. On the left here, you can also click and determine what spawn you want to use by using the left. Now, I got into that screen again by hitting my enter key. Hitting enter will bring this screen back up and where you can go back into team selection if you want to switch teams, section selection if you want to ch change your section or if you want to change your role, and then, of course, looking at the map or deployment. So as we can see, we have frontline B243, which is read out by B. It's alphabet on the top of the map. B2, 2 is on the left here. 4 is the sub grid, and then 3 is the mini grid within this 4 grid. So that's how you read the map. So once again, that's alphabets on the top. The first number is on the side. So B2 would be B right here, 2, B2. 4 is going to be within this big box here now, this B2 box. We go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. It's like a number pad, okay? So... As we zoom in here, you'll see these mini boxes within the B2 grid. This whole big square is the B2. We go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. So B2, 4. And then within the 4 grid, there's smaller boxes here. So this is the 3, right? So it's read out the same. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. And that's important to know how to read the map because sometimes squad leaders are going to tell you where to go or what spawn to use based on the grid location. So now you know how to read the map. So we spawned at B243, which is this spawn right here. You could have chose to spawn at the B357 spawn, which is this spawn down here, B357. And you can see hovering over it will tell you the same information. There's two other spawns that you need to know how to use. Um, the other spawn is going to be your section leader spawn. Your section leader has the ability to create rally points or to just destroy the rally point and have you spawn on him proper. So what that means is if there's a rally point that exists because your squad leader placed it, you can only spawn on the rally point or at a main deployment spawn. 
But if you do not have a rally point because your squad leader either destroyed the rally point or he never put one down, a section will come up right here that says spawn on section leader. And this is similar to games like Battlefield, where if you click on this, you'll spawn near the squad leader. And you can only do that if he's safe, not in the objective, and if he's alive. If he's dead, you can't spawn on him. And getting into whether a squad leader should use section leader spawns or rally spawns, that's a different, more advanced topic for another time. But it's important to know as a new player how to use the spawn section screen. So now that we're done looking at the spawns, let's take a look at the objectives and how to read this map. This is front lines, okay? Which means that this game mode works by commanding the most amount of objectives in the current active zone and then holding it until the timer goes down. Once the timer goes down, whoever holds the majority of sections, the map will flip to that side. For example, blue has three regions here, a neutral region, red has three regions here. If blue were to take the alpha and Charlie objective, which is two out of the three objectives here, and then the time goes down from four to one, the map will then flip and this red section will now become available because blue held the majority in the neutral, time ticks down to zero, blue continues to hold the majority in the middle, it flips now and a whole bunch of new capture points will end up spawning in this red rectangle here. And the same thing will happen, timer will reset and timer will tick down. And at the end of that timer within this zone, let's say blue continues to hold the majority of objectives in this red zone, this new zone, they manage to push in and take control of it. At the end of this timer, it will then push deeper into this section. And the winner of Frontline is determined on who can reach either HQ first or at the end of X amount of rounds, who has taken the most ground. So as you can see, it can go back and forth. It's, it's a tug of war kind of game mode and it gives you that real Frontline feel. The other game mode, Assault, is much different. Well, not much different, but it's simpler. It's just linear. So instead of the teams going back and forth, left to right, what happens is that, let's say the Germans would be defending and the French are only attacking. And the Germans just have to hold out until the time ticks down and not lose their HQ. Whereas the French, if they were attacking on Assault, the Assault game mode, they would have to push all the way through to the German HQ in order to win that. So a simpler, uh, less confusing game mode whereas frontline is a lot more in-depth uh, there's a lot of back and forth and a lot of strategy that goes into front lines but now that we know how to read the map the objectives the spawns let's talk about a couple of in-game mechanics that we should know now so first thing we want to do is take a look at what we have in our arsenal if we use our mouse wheel or if we use one two three four five you can see that certain objects are tied to those keybinds much like in many other games a couple of important keys is number one is your main rifle. Number two is either your secondary or your bayonet. And number four or three, depending on what class you're playing, can be your field dressing. So your main weapon, depending on the class that you pick, might be different. For most weapons, most bolt rifle weapons, you will be able to attach a bayonet. Now we talked about this in the settings uh, before in the controls. If we go to infantry, you can see that you can equip melee right here. I have mine set to control. I think by default it's C, but I like having my crouch on C, so I swapped it around. And then you have your use melee set to middle mouse button, I believe. So we're gonna equip our bayonet by hitting our button that we've assigned, and our bayonet's now attached. Now, this is a very big part to Beyond the Wire, is bayonet charging. So how do we bayonet charge now that we've equipped our bayonet? We're going to sprint for about two seconds and then hold down the middle mouse button. And as long as we hold it down, we will charge with the bayonet out. We can hold this down for as long as we like. Now, a thing to note is that this makes you faster to run. And it also works with the commander, or not the commander, but the section charge ability. When the squad leader hits this button, you'll get a buff to your charge. Now, how do we thrust after we've started our charge, right? So we're going to charge by sprinting for a little and then holding down mill mouse and then we have to time it so let's say we want to stab this we'd have to release the mouse button to give that animation some time to thrust so mastering the bayonet charge is something that's incredibly rewarding and very important when you start to go over the top and assault enemy trenches because let's be real if you have 10 guys coming to that trench and there's only one enemy at the end trying to hold it with a bolt action rifle if all 10 of you bayonet charge down the down the trench line you're gonna stab the guy. So it's important to know how to use this. It's how charges and objective pushes are usually done and be on the wire. Uh, it's important to note though that attaching the bayonet does uh, have effects on your aiming and can make shooting a little bit harder. So sometimes you might not want to have your bayonet on if you're going for longer range shots or engagements. 
Moving on to our second weapon, which is the melee weapon, and explaining how this works. As we can see in the center of our screen, we have this little circle, and Mordhal players, this is going to look very familiar. Uh, depending on the direction in which we move our mouse, for example, if I move my mouse to the left, the arrow will go to the left. Uh, if I move the mouse to the right, the arrow will go to the right. And what that indicates is the direction that the swing will come from. So if I wanted to hit someone, like let's say I'm in the trench and I'm fighting someone. If I try to swing from the left, I'm going to hit the wall on my left. You see that? But if I swing from my right, I'll be able to hit people. So that's why this is important to know is the direction of your swing. You might hit certain objects near you or you might end up having a situation where the, the someone is parrying or you might have to hit someone on the ground and if someone's prone on the ground if you try to swing at them from from the downward angle like this you might hit the ground whereas you might need to swing above overhead to hit them properly so knowing how to manipulate the direction of your swing is very important especially when working in tight environments so now that we know how this melee swing works as you saw earlier you can parry you can block people's swings and this system while it is bare bones right now i do believe that they plan on fleshing out the melee combat system to act maybe a little bit more like Mordhau so that there's more of a skill differential and it's a lot more interesting in melee combat. But as of right now, this is the first iteration of melee combat that they've rolled out and I can only assume that they're going to improve it. So now that we know how melee combat works, it's it's primarily just making sure you don't hit things in CQB environments. And once again, that's just by moving your mouse, you can orient the direction of your swing. So if I'm running against this wall and there's a guy right here, I don't want to swing left. I want to make sure I move my mouse to the right and then left click. And that'll make sure that the swing comes through. I can even go overhead, but even then it might come in at a bad angle. So you just want to make sure that you're avoiding hitting things, uh, whether it's the ground, um, you want to make sure you go overhead when you hit people on the ground, etc, etc. Uh, and that's the basic, basic, basic guide to how to melee combat. And we'll, I'm sure we'll get more into depth on how to do, you know, better melee tricks later on. Uh, the next thing that almost every player has is a pair of wire cutters. Now, on certain maps, these are more important. Um, but on maps like uh, Freeze, for example, getting rid of barbed wire or even on Zonbeak, if you need to, what you're just going to do is like there's a ton of barbed wire all over the map. And every player with wire cutters can simply walk up to it and hold down left click and just hold it down for about 10 seconds and over time boom the barbed wire is now now gone so depending on certain objectives certain objectives are covered in barbed wire you may or may not need to use your wire cutters to remove the uh the obstacle so now that's pretty much all of the basic mechanics that you need to know as an infantryman um the last thing we're going to talk about is something that's relevant for everyone is how to stop yourself from bleeding so if you get shot or take damage from let's say a grenade or maybe a field gun and you're not dead but you're wounded you need to use your field dressing this is accessed by either once again using your mouse wheel or clicking the proper button and then holding right click right click heals yourself and stops yourself from bleeding left click stops others so let's say we had a buddy here and i wanted to stop him from bleeding i would take out my field dressing and left click him this is especially important when you play the medic role because it's how you heal other people and how you revive them as well with the medic tool so that is the pretty much the most rough and dirty basic guide to all the gameplay mechanics that you could possibly need to know how to use within beyond the wire for your first couple of games as you get more experience you can move on and start messing with different roles whether that's the lmg the grenadier role see how those kits work and all those kits have different unique strategies and tactics and skills to them that you need to learn how to use in order to you know become an asset to your team because you don't want to play this game like a solo player runoff gang lone wolf kills you want to play tactical shooters with teamwork with communication be an asset be a positive force in the community encourage others to do so and the game is going to be much more enjoyable so with that all the way all the nitty-gritty mechanics and basic controls out of the way let's talk about some of the higher level important topics so the first one is using your microphone making sure that you can communicate with others whether it's using local proximity chat or if it's using your squad comms make sure that you're talking with other people find a community to join this helps improve communication and teamwork and it ensures that you can have a more consistent experience when launching beyond the wire you want to make sure that you have the most fun whenever possible because hey everyone's time is valuable and you all deserve to have a fun time when you're playing your game and the last thing is as beyond the wire is in early access there's going to be very little as far as official game support and guides and tutorials and tips and things like that do your research there's tons of content creators 
and other community members that put out massive guides, great videos. Do your research, look around, look for third party information because as Beyond the Wire gets developed, they're focusing on very important priority topics and features before they move on to this kind of information, which whether you look at it could be good or bad, but it's really important that you know that you will have to get for the majority of these early access or indie game studio uh, first person shooters, you will have to look up this information on your own. And there's tons of channels that do that. You can check it out over here on my channel. You can go over to other people's channel um, and, and, and just look for all the information that you can get. Maybe you eventually become that person that provides that information and that's going to be uh, really important and you'll become an asset to the community. So there's a lot of opportunities here to learn, to help others learn and just, it's important that we make sure that we're kind to other people, we teach other people and we help this genre and this game to grow because that's what's so great about this tactical close-knit community is that everyone kind of helps themselves be a positive force i can't say that enough in these games but that's gonna wrap up episode one of our beyond the wire guide as always guys if you're looking to pick up a copy of beyond the wire make sure you check out the link in the description or in the comments and as always subscribe comment share the video and i do appreciate all of that and just keep your eye out if you aren't planning on buying Beyond the Wire right now. It is in early access. They are rolling out more and more features. I do wholeheartedly believe that Beyond the Wire offers something unique that other tactical shooters right now do not offer. And it does deserve your attention. Whether it's now or later on, I do think Beyond the Wire is going to earn your money. But I'm going to wrap it up here, guys. I hope you did enjoy today's video. And as always, until next time, guys, good hunting.